the different seasonal uh, potential impacts of prescribed fire on both northern long-eared bats and Indiana bats across the season. So if you want to take a look at that, you can download that from the Tree Search website where Forest Service publications are housed. Now, a couple years ago, I gave a talk for the uh, Indiana Hardwood Lumbermen's Association and uh, didn't find out until I actually got to the venue to give the talk that they had changed the title of my talk to the Indiana Bat, Six Grams of Grief. And so I quickly changed uh, the title of my PowerPoint and told them it was more like seven and a half grams of grief. And <laughs> that's, that's pretty much true with the northern long-eared bat too. These are two small myotis bats. Myotis means mouse-eared. So they are close cousins. They have some very different habits, but also some very similar habits. And both of these species overlap with the distribution of the shortleaf pine um, in a good portion of their range. Why should you be concerned about bats? Um, and why should you care when you're managing for shortleaf pine about bats? Well, bat populations are declining. Many of you are probably aware of the uh, epidemic disease white nose syndrome, which is killing bats throughout the eastern United States and in uh, Canada as well. And we have seen catastrophic declines in both the Indiana bat and the northern long-eared bat across their ranges. The declines have varied, but in some parts we've seen over 90% of population decline. And I'm going to just show you some data from the Smokies where I've done work for the past uh, five or six years just to illustrate this point. So going back and looking at our captures per unit of effort, this is the number of bats we catch over the net area and number of hours we have the net open. You can see what the data looked like for northern long-eared bats in blue and Indiana bats in green. Back in 2009, mind you, the Indiana bat has been federally endangered since 1967. But back in 2009, the northern long-eared bat was one of the most common bats that we captured in the Smokies. And we have seen that change dramatically such that now in 2015, both species are about equally rare. And this summer we caught seven northern long-eared bats in 32 nights of netting, which is just insane. So we're putting in tons and tons of effort. We should be catching seven northern long-eared bats every night, not seven over the course of the summer. And so these bat populations are declining dramatically. And that's gonna have uh, some effect on our management and something that people aren't really talking about much yet but we need to keep this in mind because everything that we know about what bats do is going to change when we're looking at not a colony of 40, 50, 60 or 100 individuals but rather 10 you know or solo individuals that would like to be in a maternity colony but are forced to roost alone because there's nobody else out there to roost with and these bats are becoming more rare across the landscape so they're going to change the types of roosts that they use, they may have different thermoregulatory strategies, and that's actually really important to think about when we're thinking about burning. Now, I wish I could have gotten the uh, range map for shortleaf pine ahead of time. Um, Jim, I'll have to talk to you about that, so that I could uh, overlap that with the range of the Indiana bat, but for now, just accept this uh, poor effort which shows the ranges of oak and pine forests across the eastern U.S. and then the overlapping range of the Indiana bat in black. And you can see that in much of its range, the Indiana bat does overlap with oak and pine forests and so, uh, so forth, I guess, fire-adapted ecosystems. The Indiana bat's range has been expanding in recent years, um, not because the bat is expanding, but because we're get, but it, probably because we're getting better at looking for it. And we've recently found it in northern Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and in central Virginia in areas where we didn't uh, know that they occurred. And lo and behold, in those areas, they're uh, using pine trees as their roosts. The northern long-eared bat has a much broader range and is found even as far as eastern Montana, pretty much across all of the eastern United States. And there's been some recent work that has shown that they are using the coastal plain of North Carolina, which is interesting because we had no idea that they were there until just a few years ago. South and we, we don't, South Arkansas, yeah. So we don't know where those bats are hibernating uh, that are roosting in uh, trees in the summer in Eastern North Carolina. But for both of these species, they primarily spend the winter in caves. That's what we typically know. So studies that have been done where pines occur and these bats occur have shown that pines are important roosts for both Indiana bats and northern long-eared bats. So in East Tennessee and Western North Carolina, where I have done work in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, 
Cherokee National Forest and the Nantahala National Forest have found that 64% of the Indiana bat roosts were in dead yellow pines. Most of the roosts were in pines, period, but we did find quite a few in white pine. But of those dead yellow pine roosts, which was 64%, we found that most of those were shortleaf pine. And I have to say that I'm surprised that people are just kind of starting to revive interest and really get going on shortleaf pine back in 2010 because that is when I had quickly decided that this was my favorite tree because it's the tree that I find Indiana bats in most. And I've never changed my password to the uh, genus and species of any other pine tree, but I have for shortleaf pine. So if that tells you anything. Uh, so in Arkansas, uh, Roger Perry has done tracking work with both uh, male and female northern long-eared bats and also with male Indiana bats. And he found that with the male and female northern long-eared bats, that 71% of the roosts were in dead shortleaf pines. You can see from the picture, uh, the big picture on the right, that the, uh, the tree produces a great patch of bark when it dies that creates a nice haven for a large colony of bats. Even the smallest shortleaf pine trees, when the bark pops off the trunk, it creates a great space for bats to roost in. And you could fit uh, probably a couple hundred bats in that patch on the uh, big pine on the left, which is a shortleaf. And then uh, when Roger has done some tracking work with male Indiana bats, he's finding that they're roosting in shortleaf pine in the fall. And some unpublished work uh, from Kentucky, from Mark Gumbert, and also from Paul Moseman on the Daniel Boone National Forest has also illustrated that's that shortleaf pines, dead shortleaf pines, are a very important roost type for male Indiana bats, um, which sometimes hang out near hibernation sites during the summer. And so a lot of our work has been in the summer, and there's been very little work outside of the summer season, so kudos to Roger for doing that. I've been trying to do that myself in the Smokies now for the past couple years, working in both the spring and the summer to get a better handle on what it is that these bats are doing during those time periods. But their bats are far and few between, and so it's been difficult for us to gain a lot of data. What I've found through my work in the Southern Apps, uh, trying to document the, the distribution of snags, is that suitable yellow pine snags are far less common um, than they probably were uh, around the time that the Southern Pine Beetle hit. So I, I have done some inventory of pine snags. And I have this illustration here that shows you what a typical known roost for an Indiana bat might look like, uh, which is much taller and um, has more bark usually and, and more height uh, anyways than the yellow pine that's pictured here, which is more the typical yellow pine. White pines seem to be in a little bit lower state of decay than our typical yellow pine snags, and so those still provide a great roost type for Indiana bats. And we find that hemlocks are just now starting to become used as roosts for Indiana bats in this region. As uh, Jim alluded to, it may take quite some time to grow a large yellow pine. So that rather large tree in the previous slide was a 220-year-old uh, yellow pine in uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And so we found that it, it can take a long time to grow the trees that are of the size that, that meets the criteria for a known roost. And, and Clarence Coffey, who invited me to come and talk to you all, asked me to consider this point. Will bats switch to alternate roost types, um, you know, is, is my take here. But the question that Clarence asked me is if we are going to restrict burning during the season when bats are, um, you know, perhaps sensitive, we might, you know, end up not converting the forest back to the condition that we'd like to, to restore shortleaf pine. And is that going to be a problem for the bats, or are we doing the bats more of a favor by restricting burning and not, uh, not potentially taking bats uh, that are at roost? And, and my answer to that, Clarence, is that bats will switch to alternate roosts, and it's possible that where shortleaf pine used to be more abundant, and has become less abundant that Indiana bats have just shifted to using different types of trees such as oaks, ash, elm, and poplar. We see them using shagbark hickories. In some places they use black locust, and not all of these are desirable timber species, but uh, bats are pretty flexible, and so they will shift into different roost tree species. They're really looking not so much for the species as for the structure. So they need a tree that's tall, they need a tree that provides good sloughing bark, and they need a tree that is going to be 
um, a little less ephemeral, which is interesting because they seem to really like these pine trees. And those patches of bark can fall off in just you know a matter of days after you find the bat. And some big storm comes through, and that thing is gone. So. Um, so I'm not sure. We don't have the data to say, you know, are we doing the bats a, a favor? Or are, we, are we helping them by um, restricting burning during the seasons when they might be most sensitive? But I want to talk a little bit more about that. So we have this concern uh, for take and how that um, is going to affect our fire policy. So as you probably know, take is any action that could result in harassment all the way up to killing of an endangered species. And, and this is primarily applied to the Indiana bat, uh, but now to the northern long-eared bat, which has been recently listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And potentially harmful management actions include timber harvest and fire, and that's why um, I get asked to give talks like this to kind of explain what we have to consider. And so there are potential direct and indirect effects of fire on Indiana bats, and I'm just going to list out here the uh, the negative direct effects, unfortunately all the direct effects that I can think of are going to be negative, so killing bats at roosts or caves, um, loss of critical roosting habitat if a snag is consumed during a fire, potentially burning bats' ears during intense fires, bats wasting energy reserves flying around trying to get out of a fire, and potentially predation risk from daytime flight to escape fire. But I think that with uh, proper planning that we could minimize a lot of these direct effects uh, just thinking about how to implement fire and when to implement fire. Some long-term indirect effects, and I have both positive and negative here, just in case you're wondering. Uh, destroying roosting habitat, which is typically snags, if those are taken out for the long term. Um, and potentially destroying foraging habitat if a fire is severe. But on the flip side, we could be creating roosting habitat by creating large pine and oak trees, uh, creating large and small snags and creating more open conditions, which could be ideal foraging habitat for bats. And again, just thinking about that, um, well, sorry, so open conditions with regards to roosting would be more solar exposure for the bats, giving them a better chance to raise their pups in warm conditions during the summer. But then with the open foraging habitat, that open condition could be very good for um, bats that want to fly around under the forest canopy and perhaps have some insect pulses. And Luke Dodd at uh, the uh, Eastern Kentucky University is working on this over in Mammoth Cave. And then of course there's the reduced wildfire risk by having more burning. So this graphic shows the times when you can burn relative to Indiana bat presence. So if we want to think about um, the current restrictions on this, <coughs> then anything within the burn give or take, there's a little bit of give or take here depending on where you're working and what kind of arrangement you've got worked out with Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, this is the period when you can burn. And I know that, you know, ideal periods for putting fire on the ground to, to uh, restore pines are probably going to be somewhere in here, perhaps somewhere in here. And so this, this gets uh, a little bit tricky and unfortunately it's the time period when we know the least about what bats are doing. Right now with the northern long-eared bat, the restriction is only uh, don't burn in June and July, but you could burn outside of that season. Now, just briefly, I want to walk through the annual life cycle of these myotis bats and consider how fire might affect them. So first we'll think about winter hibernation, which during that period bats are clustered in caves, uh, presumably in large numbers. We don't really know for northern long-eared bats, but we do for Indianas. They're dropping their temperatures, going into torpor, and uh, they only usually wake up about once every two weeks naturally, although whiteness has disrupted that. And so what are the fire effects during winter? Well, you could have smoke effects. Smoke could be noxious, um, actually toxic to the bats, or it could just cause additional arousals, waking them up. And so the recommendation that Susan and I made in our publication was to avoid burning when atmospheric conditions might draw smoke into caves. And I will note that Mammoth Cave National Park has successfully burned very near Indiana bat hibernacula during the winter. Thinking about spring emergence and migration, this is really a critical period. This is a time when everybody wants to burn, and it's also a time when the bats are probably at their most vulnerable. Females have just emerged from hibernation. They've gone out onto the summer landscape, but it's still spring. We've got cool periods and warm periods. The bats are just becoming pregnant. They've actually stored sperm and waited until spring to become pregnant. And they're, so they're, they're trying to rebuild their energy reserves, especially after dealing with white nose syndrome during the winter. And 
they're roosting in conditions that uh, typically are going to be something like what's pictured here, perhaps a live tree uh, where they can get a lot of shelter from a, a major storm that might come through during the spring. But I've also seen them in, in dead trees. So I tracked a female Indiana bat in late April, early May this year, and she roosted in a large dead white pine. Pretty typical of what I would see during the summer. The difference uh, from what I would see in the summer is that she spent two and a half days in this pine and didn't leave it at all. So, and I know that because we put a data logger on the tree. And that's the kind of behavior that gives me pause with regards to implementing fire during that time period because the bat was probably deep in torpor because it was pretty cool. And so we have to think about perhaps burning on warm days. And so I'll give you that, these caveats. So uh, we might be harassing, harming, or wounding bats that are at roost if we burn during the spring. And as I've mentioned earlier, the effects on the roosting and foraging habitat could be positive, negative, or neutral. But our recommendation would be that if you burn on warm days or if you burn in the late afternoon, then that could enable a quick response by bats, especially if a bat is in torpor during the morning period, then allowing them to um, respond to the fire during the warmest period of the day might be good. And so there's been some experimental work on this in Kentucky, and they found that northern long-eared bats left the roost in about 10 minutes after a fire was lit in the late afternoon. That was before they were listed as threatened. Uh, so summer maternity period, uh, this is the time when bats are roosting in these large dead trees and typically have um, a lot of pups and a lot of individuals in the tree. And how they use trees varies across the summer season. I won't go into a lot of detail on that. But uh, growing season burns are often prohibited within the range of the Indiana bat uh, because of concerns about take of, uh, of adults and their pups but we could have some indirect effects from burns outside the growing season that do affect bats during the summer, uh, such as the creation or uh, depletion of snags in the areas that the bats are roosting. So loss of some large snags, and I've seen that, but we also have seen where we've created new snags over the longer term with really intense fires. And obviously, as you're hoping here, you know, by repeated burning, you could be uh, promoting some optimal forest types like shortleaf pine and getting some of those oak and pine woodlands, which you showed some great pictures of, and those could be really optimal foraging habitat for the bats. And so I think that um, it's important to consider that we could be really creating good conditions by doing some uh, growing season burns or just giving good conditions during the growing season if we uh, do repeated burns. And perhaps those oak and pine savannas. Okay, now fall migration and swarming. We know uh, very little about what bats are doing during this time period too, but uh, in general, bats are leaving the summer lens landscape and heading back to the hibernacula where they are going to swarm at the entrance to a cave to find mates. And during this time period, females usually will mate and then go into the hibernacula, but males will stay out on the summer lands or on the, on the landscape around the hibernacula using trees for many days at a time. So uh, this data from Gumbert's uh, thesis from Kentucky has some great illustrations, which I've included in this presentation. And this is a typical tree for a male during the fall season, a dead tree that is um, a bit shaded, um, allowing the male to drop into torpor and uh, save some energy during the day so he can save all his energy for chasing females at night. And what do we expect to see here? Well, again, we may be harassing, harming, or wounding bats at roost if we're burning during the fall. And we still, as I said, know very little about uh, what these bats are doing then. Um, this could affect their roosting and foraging habitat in a number of different ways. And so we recommend burning during warm periods, just like in spring, uh, to possibly enable a quicker response by the bats. But keeping in mind that fire behavior may vary in the fall versus the spring because of the fact that conditions are drier and so fires could potentially be more intense. Now, as you all are probably aware, there are these potential effects on bats of not burning, and this is part of what Clarence is asking me to consider. You know, what if we don't burn, we might lose these pine and oak woodlands, and that could be bad for the bat. It's too soon to say if this is detrimental. It would take a pretty um, large-scale experiment to prove that Indiana bats are reliant on these pine and oak woodlands or that they might be benefiting from them. It's very difficult to measure recruitment and to understand, you know, how these management activities are actually affecting population sizes in these species because they're so difficult to study. 
But we also have this increased wildfire risk. And so that for that reason, um, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park has implemented this let it burn policy to just go ahead and let some of these wildfires occur so that we can reduce the risk in the future. And of course, not burning could also lead us to more cluttered forests, which could make it more difficult for bats to forage as opposed to these open conditions in the oak and pine savannas that we might like to create. So can we find harmony between prescribed fire and restoration of shortleaf pines and, and management for bats? Well, this, this is a picture of the same tree that had the great patch of barks left off. And this is the base of the tree. Um, with a red oak that was standing beside it that had fallen. And, and this is a shortleaf pine that's standing in a, a twice burned stand in Arbutus Ridge over in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And I think that where we're headed here is towards a condition that will be favorable for bats for both roosting and foraging. And so if we can do with low intensity burns and we can keep in mind burning on times when bats most, or when, at times when bats are less vulnerable, I think that we could go a long way towards uh, restoring their populations and their their habitat. So I'd like to thank the folks that funded the study um, studies that I have done that have led to this. And I don't know if I have any time for questions since we're kind of behind on schedule, but I'll be happy to talk to any of you during a break. We've got a couple minutes if there's questions. McCree. Yeah, what, what has ambient air temperature when you, you said warmer days, what do you recommend on air temperature? Well, we generally think of bad activity as being low when it's below about 50 or 55 degrees. It, uh, it depends on where you are. Some bats are quite tolerant of being active. Um, but I would say that that's, that's kind of what we've seen is that, you know, maybe, maybe below 60, the bats are more likely to just hang out in the tree and go into torpor during the day and not um, come out at night because they know that that nighttime temperature is just going to be too cool. There's not going to be a lot of insect activity, so they'll just drop into torpor. So we're working on analyzing some of the meager data that we have from the Smokies on that uh, from the past couple of years. We just have a handful of bats. For the long eared bat, you're talking about roost trees from a dead snag. As far as when they raise the young, is it still the same thing? Are roost trees and when they raise the young the same? It's still dead trees? Mm -hmm. Northern long-eared bats are a lot more flexible than Indiana bats, so both species will favor roosting in dead trees. Indiana bats almost exclusively roost under the sloughing bark of a dead tree, whereas a northern long-eared bat will roost under sloughing bark, in cracks and crevices, in cavities in trees that are live or dead, in broken branches, in a little hole in a roto limb. I mean, just anywhere these bats will roost. And so they're, they're very uh, flexible in their roost types. But by and large, both species favor dead trees as their roost and large dead trees because that holds more bats. But like I said, with reduced population sizes um, and smaller colony sizes, we may see that change. Historically, the, the Indiana bat has been listed because of uh, disturbance at hibernacula was thought to be the primary cause of their decline. So when they were listed in 1967, we didn't even know where they went in the summer. We didn't have radio telemetry yet. So all we knew was that populations on the hibernation sites were changing dramatically. And it was assumed that this was due to a lot of different disturbances that were occurring at hibernacula, people gating off hibernacula. One major cave in Kentucky was converted to a gift shop. Um, and the bats came back to their you know, winter site and couldn't get in. Um, and people killing bats in caves, Boy Scouts killed bats in a cave in Kentucky, thought they were doing everybody a favor. And um, so those types of disturbances are, are what drove the listing of the Indiana bat. And summer habitat loss has typically been placed lower on the list. Um, and of course, forest management versus actual loss of habitat conversion to other forest types or other uh, land cover types. Is, probably not as big of a deal, so. So those problems have been confirmed because the still? I don't know that we'll ever know for sure, but you know, what they knew was that there were major disturbances at hibernacula leading up to them being listed, so. Okay, do you want me to stop? Yeah, we've got all <laughs> there for time. I'll talk to you, I'm sitting right beside you. Thank um, you, Joy. Thank you.